what a day. This has been an amazing day. I haven't really been puttering around with you because I've been going over some things and watching from the green room, which has been really, really exciting to listen to everything. I do have to say right off the bat that uh, whoever gave me a time limit for this has obviously never met me. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. Uh, I do know that there's a little bit of an after social, so I'll try not to take up any valuable time. Um, I was asked to come today and speak about critical moments. So I was actually kind of given a little bit of a topic. So my interpretation of, of critical moments, I guess, is um, critical decision making. It's those moments in time where you are literally stuck with a decision and you can go, you, clearly you go one way or you go the other. It's those, it's those forks in the road. And that's what I really want to address today. So first of all, I just want to ask you to think back, you know, probably quite clearly to the time when you were five or six years old. And I want you to try and remember what you had thought you were going to be when you grew up. Was it a doctor? Was it a fireman? Was it, you know, a musician? Was it a, an engineer here at Waterloo? I don't know about you, but when I was five or six, my, I knew my grandfather was an engineer. I thought he drove trains. So, <laughs> I, when I was six, I had never heard about bobsledding. I mean, I didn't, I didn't bobsled till I didn't start bobsledding till I was 27. So. I mean, clearly my path changed a number of times from the time that I was five or six till the time that I was 27, and even until now. So basically though, the reason that I was invited to come and talk to you today was, I mean, we just watched that video, was because I could bring it with me. <laughs> so <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is the coolest part about winning something like this, is that I get to do fun, cool things like this all the time. So this is, I'm going to just explain a little bit about the medal. Some of you probably know the background. So pardon me, I'm going to, you know, you probably already know this, but I'm going to regurgitate for those people who haven't heard it. Um, the Royal Canadian Mint developed these medals. They spent two and a half years developing these. They developed 615 Olympic gold medals that slightly overlap one another to make up that design. So, my medal fits right there in the image. It overlaps and that is the imprint that is on my medal. So basically the thought process behind this, which I think is amazing, I mean Canadians, we, we did it the best, didn't we? Um, <laughs> basically the thought process behind this was that all of the medals are linked in some way. And they said that every Olympic medalist will forever be connected in some way for the rest of their lives. They've achieved something, they've achieved something great together, so they have a connection. But the reason why they've made the designs different on every single one is because it reflects the different stories that every athlete has. You will not get Alex Bilodeau up here telling you the same story that I'll be telling you. Everybody's story is different. And that's why it's, these are medals are so neat because they reflect the different design on this. As you can see there, my medal's on the right and my driver, Kaylee, hers is on the left. We have very, very different stories. I mentioned I didn't start bobsledding until I was 27. She started when she was 16, 17. Clearly a different path we took. So I'm gonna talk about some of those decisions. Some of those um, forks in the road that basically made my design on my medal completely different from anybody else's. We're talking about forks in the road, okay? And these forks are, well, I guess when you, when you come to a fork, let's talk about human nature. Human nature, it's just human nature to want to take the path of least resistance. We want to take what's easiest, we want to take what's less stressful, what is less confrontational, we tend to go to what is easiest. But that's not always necessarily the most gratifying. We want to go, just go with the flow. Now, I'm going to use an example. Sometimes we make decisions that aren't necessarily what we authentically want for ourselves, but we make this because of peer pressure, or parental pressure, or what we think that people expect of us, even though it's not what we truly, truly want to do. 
And sometimes it's just cues that we get around us, like social cues. For example, I believe we all know this child. I believe that we all know this child well. That child has either been in a grocery cart that you have pushed or has been in the lineup in front of you waiting in the checkout. And if you really look carefully at this child, I'm pretty sure my estimate, I estimate that that is eight seconds away from a high-powered meltdown. <laughs> Maybe seven seconds, but I'm giving a little leeway here. Um, basically, that seven seconds, that is now a critical moment. Critical moments don't always have to be like career-solving forks in the road. Right now, this is a fork in the road for that parent or that caretaker who is watching that child. Now, the decisions, now why are these decisions difficult? Because, well, you have all the staring eyes of all of these people watching you, watching how, you're, how are you going to raise your child. Right now, this is a lesson right here in the grocery store. Let's see it, what are you gonna do? <laughs> and on the one side, you just want them to stop staring at you, so you want to buy your child a candy bar. Easy, easy peasy, kid will stop crying, you can go home. However, that is probably going to repeat itself every single time you ever go to a grocery store again. So on the other hand, you want to teach your children lessons. You want, do you want to raise them into being responsible adults who go to Waterloo? And <laughs> thank you. Um, and so you want them to, to, to learn a lesson. So you're at this crossroads, but you know that that meltdown is going to happen. You, do you choose the easy path, the path of least resistance, or do you choose what aligns with the values that you have and what you actually want to teach your child? So this is a quote that I actually saw on a billboard outside of a church downtown Toronto about probably about two years ago, and I loved it. And I, I, it really hit home for me. And I think that this is something that really um, affects our society in general. I think it's um, something that if you really think about it, you realize how often this occurs. I mean, we talk about everything that we wish we could do, or everything we want to do, but what actions are we taking in order to pursue those? You know, the things that we truly value in life and all of these different things, they don't align with our actions and behaviors, and that's, that's part of the problem. People say, oh, it's a pipe dream. Well, really, what's a pipe dream? Maybe it's just a dream without a plan. So. Basically, when it comes down to this, you're on that conundrum. You're on, do I decrease the stress levels and take that easy path? And that's where the discrepancy comes in. So you're, the discrepancy is what you actually want and what you truly value versus what you're prepared to do, making things less, you want to make things more comfortable, you want to take away any stress, any resistance. The problem with resistance is that that leads you down a road that leads you down the path of low accomplishment, of being ordinary. So this picture, I really enjoy this picture. My sister might hate that I put this up there, but if you recognize the child in the middle, that is clearly a middle child syndrome right there at work. Um, my sister on the end, um, I like using this photo because it kind of looks like she's on something. And she hates this photo. <laughs> and my brother has probably never busted out of anything again in his life. So this is a very entertaining picture for me. But this does remind me of family. It reminds me of family values. And when I talk about family values, I talk about also in terms of what's best for not only yourself, but also what's best for your family as a whole. And how sometimes you have to make these unorthodox decisions that aren't mainstream, that are more difficult because it's nothing like what anybody else is doing. So my family, my parents, decided that what was really important for them was to have one day during the week that was just a family day. So they made it Sunday, because I mean, the weekday is so busy, so insane. Saturday, we're off usually birthday parties or friends and stuff. So Sunday was family day. And, you know, that sounds all very nice. It sounds wonderful. 
But when you start growing up and you have, you're told you have so much athletic potential and you've got all these teams that you're playing for, and then in goes my parents to my coach's office explaining to every single coach I ever had that I would not be, if they held a practice on Sunday, I would not be there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. The pressures that we experience today, I mean, I can just imagine people saying, you could be risking her athletic career. Well, clearly it did. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that was a decision that was so important to them. It was, it was something that it didn't matter, all these external pressures and all of these things. What mattered to them was keeping our family tight, keeping us as a close family, and enjoying time together. And that, to them, was higher on the priority list than satisfying an athletic program because they wanted me to play. So the fact that they made that unorthodox decision, I think, kind of led me towards being able to make some. So now we're at, we see the Olympics here. We're good. Um, and this kind of gives us all warm and fuzzies. Everyone, you know, talks about wishing they could go to the Olympics. Well, what would you do right now? If you got home tonight or tomorrow night, you're having a nice supper and somebody gives you a phone call. You answer the phone, and it's someone on the other end saying, I have been asked to do recruiting for bobsledding, and I think you would be perfect for it. I think you have the perfect combination, or pick whatever sport you want. doesn't matter. You would be perfect for it. The Olympics are in about eight months. You would totally make it. Right now, I know what the program's like. You would be there for sure. You could, become, you could be an Olympian. What would you say? Would you drop everything? Would you change your life around and put things on hold and do that? So would you follow that? Well, I, because we just watched a video of us winning at the Olympics, I'm sure you're going to assume that I said yes, but I did not. That phone call came to me in the spring, early summer of 2001, before the Olympics in Park City in 2002. I had no desire to be an Olympian. I had... I had always wanted, or for as long as I could remember, I'd always wanted to work in a developing country. So I just said, no, I'm not interested. What do you mean you're not interested? You could be called an Olympian. Okay, but no thank you. That's full spandex, hello. <laughs> so I actually said no. And I ended up going to Trinidad. I, it was a nine-month internship, but I ended up living there for almost three years. I loved it. Sometimes we have to realize that what it may not look like a success to the mainstream population, because it's not in the media. But because that was my goal, that's what I'd wanted to do, that was a success for me. I think it would be like a comparison with someone who you know, goes to med school. They go to med school, they become a doctor, but they don't do it because they love it, they do it because that's what their parents wanted. And all they ever wanted to do was be a musician or be an artist or be a police officer. All they wanted to do was, you know, protect their town and city and, you know, and, and, but they ended up going. So from the outside, you know, the parents will be like, oh, my son, he's a success. And then on the, messages for me? And then on the other side, for him, does he feel like a success? Or would he have felt more authentically successful if he had actually followed what his gut was telling him to do. And I think that makes the difference. So another example is rugby. So after I ended, four years later, I ended up running into that same recruiter who started hounding me again. So long story short, I ended up going to bobsledding. <laughs> um, and I, on the route to Vancouver, so I did the Torino Olympics my first year, I went back the next year, finished my master's degree, but then I decided we came fourth in Torino, and I did not want that to be my story. I did not want that to be my legacy, so I went back. Now, during the closer it got to Vancouver, however, the more I was getting requests from some of the drivers and some of the coaches kind of insisting and hinting and then, and then outright telling me that I needed to quit playing rugby, that it was too high risk. Now, I'll tell you about high risk. High heels on a shag carpet, that is high risk. <laughs> but I, 
when I thought about that, I said, high risk for what though? Like, what, 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 do I, what do I really want to do? If my only goal in life was to go to the Olympics and be a gold medalist for bobsledding, then yes, playing rugby, bungee jumping, any of those sorts, that all would have been high risk. And it probably, pros and cons list, it would have outweighed and I would have just stuck with bobsledding. But to not do something that I loved, they recruited me as a rugby player. They knew I was a rugby player. It's probably how I developed my skills as power and speed. So I said, no, you take me as a rugby player or you choose not to take me. And I'll still keep playing rugby and still love playing rugby. So we make these decisions. Fork in the road, make the decision that is right authentically for you, and then you hope for the best. <laughs> so injuries. Injuries happen. I'm pretty sure the bobsled community was like, see, we told you so. But on the other hand, I don't regret my decisions. I don't regret them at all. For me, I was fulfilling what I wanted to do, what was, you know, what I was passionate about. And, you know, with every decision you make, there comes risk. But I still feel like I was a success because I remained authentic to what I wanted to do. Had I not done rugby and I gave in to them and I just did bobsledding, I would have always wondered. You know, I wonder if I could have kept playing rugby. Who wants to live with that? Always wondering if you could have done something. So for me, I stayed true to myself, followed my gut, and I still feel like it was a successful and the right decision for me. All right. So here's another example of making a decision that is not popular by any means. So once you actually make the national bobsled team, they, most athletes just up and move to Calgary. That is the central location for training. That is where, as you'll see in a second, that is where they have um, a state-of-the-art facility where people from all over the world come and train there. It's an ice house, and it's an indoor refrigerated building where you can practice, I'll show you, you can practice pushing a frame sled, you can add stacked weights to it if you want more resistance, you do all that stuff, and that's basically what you're doing. It's just an amazing facility in Calgary. So everybody just moves there, they can all train together, they have all their training facilities, their training groups, all of that stuff. So it just seems very easy. I, on the other hand, thought that moving and living and dealing with people that I would have to be on tour with all year would not necessarily be the best decision for me mentally. I chose to follow what I thought was right for me, base it on mental health, and I knew that I, need, I needed to be around some family. I needed to be around friends. I needed to be around people who could keep me grounded, and where on a daily basis I was reminded that there were things that were more important or just as important as sports, that there were other things, other priorities on the list, that sport wasn't the only thing that mattered, and I needed that. And besides, I mean, like, I grew up in Prince Edward Island. It's not like we don't have good technique, like, <laughs> I mean, we've got great technology there. It's, you know, you make these unorthodox decisions, you make them work for you. And I mean, you can't really dispute that that's the exact position I needed to be in to push a sled. <laughs> so it worked. My mental health was great. I wasn't tired of dealing with my teammates by the time the Olympics came around. I was, I'd been surrounded by people who were supportive and yet not all encompassing and all consuming. It was wonderful. And I think making all these decisions, you just, you just have to back them up. You make these decisions, you take this fork, you take the path that's not where everyone else is going. And you just do whatever you can to make sure that you look back on that decision and you have no regrets. You make sure that you followed your gut instinct, you knew that that decision was right for you, and then you do everything you can so you can be at the end and say, I did everything possible to make my dream come true. So this last example um, is basically just Kaylee, my driver, my bobsled driver. I don't have a chauffeur, but um, was Kaylee and I at the Olympic Games. Now I have to explain a little bit about how the, the games run. So for World Cup races, we have two heats and they accumulate the times. For World Championships and Olympic Games, it's four heats, two heats on two days, and they add up all the times for the heats. 
Now, ever since I started bobsledding, I would look at the drivers who would run up, just, they would run up after their, after their first heat, and they would look at the timesheets. Now, it's important to understand what rank, where you're sitting in terms of ranking, because that decides the order in which you descend the second run. So that's important. But what's not important is knowing whether someone is two hundredths of a second behind you, whether you're tied with someone, whether you're, you know, you have four hundredths of a second to make up time to beat someone else. In my opinion, that is only detrimental. That can only cause you grief. How is that? A, I don't. Un People would look at that, and I heard one pilot say, "Oh, oh, well, I'm only two hundredths of a second behind her. I think I can pick up speed in corner four. Why didn't you do that the first time?" If you could get more speed in corner four, I'm sorry, but why didn't you do that the first time? So I used to talk a little bit out loud about this during the season, hoping Kaylee would kind of adopt that same philosophy, and she did. She just picked it up at, suddenly at the Olympic Games for all of her training runs and for all of the runs at the Olympic Games. We did not look at our time splits. We had no idea how close or how far people were. We didn't know if we were tied, but they were just letting us go down first because it's or in last because of decreasing order. We had no idea. So we had no idea that we were actually almost a full second ahead of the next place people. And when that's when considering that we lost a medal spot in Torino by five hundredths of a second after four runs, like a full second is huge in bobsledding. And we just decided we needed to stay focused. Everyone else was still looking at the times. Everyone else was still running up and down with splits and and trying to see who is closest, well, we'll just let them panic. We'll let them worry about if they make a mistake on the track, who's gonna, you know, who's gonna come and take their, like, who's gonna come up behind them. Kaylee and I just decided we were gonna focus on our runs, the technical aspect of each corner, the technical aspect of the start, and just deal with it as it came. So for us, we did make a decision to do what's best for us. We followed our gut, and that really worked for us. So now, to sum things up a little bit, all of those decisions that I explained to you were all based on a gut instinct. If I hadn't have followed my gut and did what I thought was genuinely, authentically right for me, then I probably would be living with regrets. I also probably would not have this Olympic gold medal. And so I think that when we, when we look at when we look at all of these things that are the easy paths and easy things to take, you know, we dream about starting new businesses, but we talk about how we have no time. Well, you know, if you just turn off the TV, the average American gets an extra 151 hours in a month. That's a lot of time to spend on starting, to building your dream, to starting a plan. So I challenge you as an Olympic gold medalist and a former UW. Thank you. I, I present you with a challenge. I challenge you to, to, to figure out what your gold medal is. Meaning, what is your goal? What is your ultimate dream? What do you want to do? Do you want to go on a, save to go on a cruise? Trip around the world? Start your own business? Learn how to cook? I challenge you to find out authentically, deep down, what is true to you and what you value, what you truly value in life and what is going to be the right decision for you. And I do. I challenge you to turn off that TV and spend that extra time pursuing what it is that is going to make you ultimately, authentically successful. So you need to just follow your gut because without guts, there's no glory. Thank you very much.